It's lovely to be with you for this uh, last time as, uh, as family, and um, thank you for your send-off. It's been a, um, uh, it's been a, a, a special week for, for, for me and for us as we've attended various events um, and said goodbye to uh, various people, and um, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to, I guess, be with, with family, and this is the last of a series that we're looking at um, on, it's called The Summer of Love, and uh, looking at uh, 1 John, and uh, I think that this really dovetails, and I, I don't think I'm manipulating what it's saying into what I'm wanting to say, um, I think they kind of intertwine quite nicely, but looking at the whole idea of what it means to be in God's family. God's love, as I'm kind of t- terming this talk today, God's love invites us, welcomes us home. God's love welcomes us home. I wanted to say a few things uh, that I didn't say before too about just in terms of the context of where we are going. Um, slight detour before I can continue. Um, that's to say that one of the things we're looking at doing in, with this church that we're moving to is look at uh, what the hope is to church plant. I'm currently in the process of being registered and ordained as a Baptist pastor. And uh, with this church that, that we're going to be part of, we are praying and speaking with them about church planting. So I didn't say that before, but that is part of the DNA of uh, what we're doing. And I might talk a little bit later about legacy. Um, but before we continue, can, can we pray, mostly for me, uh, as, I, um, as I preach? God, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love. We thank you that you carry us. We thank you that we are one. We sit here, gather together as one family, all under the name, the wonderful, gracious name of Jesus Christ, who calls us to himself. You call us, God. And in doing so, we are your body, we are your members, we are your family. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. What is your family like? Is it um, slightly dysfunctional? Um, Or is it just plain weird? Or maybe is your family, you know, one of those kind of crazy, chaotic families, but in the end, everything tends to resolve itself. I'm not quite sure what your family is like. Just have a bit of a think. I know when I say the word family, um, that evokes a whole bunch of emotions and feelings. Often when I speak to people about family, it always goes back to what happens at Christmas time. I'm not quite sure what that, why that is, but Christmas tends to be the time when families get together and everything gets a little bit, um, well, our families tend to do what families do, whatever that is. Uh, my family, uh, extended family, is, um, is quite large, um, not quite like well, actually, it's bigger than the Brady Bunch, to be fair. Um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the oldest of uh, seven uh, kids, and my dad is, well, we grew up, my dad was a pastor in Australia, in Brisbane, and um, our family is, it was loud, still is loud, very vocal. It's almost like a Greek family without being Greek. Um, we would have very, very passionate, and we still do have very passionate arguments and, well, I would say discussions. Um, about various things, mostly about theology. Um, I don't know why, but that's just where we go. But we do love one another. And even after all the tears and after all the, you know, kind of venting our opinions, we do tend to kind of, things do tend to work out. But families are important. Families are important because it's in families that we live, we exist. And families are important because it is the way, it is the the structure by which we grow, it's the structure in which we develop, whether that's good or bad. And and we are in a challenging times when it comes to family. The current divorce uh, uh, kind of rate in the UK is 42%. 42% of all marriages will end up in divorce. Now, that is, that's a figure that's going down, praise the Lord, but there are still challenges. There are many fatherless homes. Families are vital because they are the, the place. They, that, families create the condition by which we develop and grow. And, and what John is, is saying here is he is saying that, you know what, to, 
To be in relationship with God is to be in family. It's to be in a home. And so if we look at our Bibles, and I want you to keep your Bibles open with me, he says this, verse 16, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Now that word live is really important. That word live also means remain or abide or make one's home. Maybe your thoughts, if you know anything about John, the writer of John writes in John chapter 15, he uses the word abide or remain to be in the vine. Same word. To abide, to remain, to live, to make one's home. And this morning, I want to I look at this whole idea that God's love invites us home. And we see three relationships at work here that John looks at as what it means to be in family. What does it mean to be in the home? Firstly, it means that we are in relationship with our spiritual father, our heavenly father, God, our parent, God the Father. Secondly, we are in relationship with one another, with our siblings. And thirdly, we are in relationship with the wider world. We're in relationship with the world around us. So firstly, God is our loving Father. God is our loving Father. And I looked at this a couple of weeks ago. I guess John keeps going back and back. We are born again. God is our Father. We are born anew. And it's made possible, as we see in uh, chapter 5, it's made possible through what Jesus has done for us. But more importantly, I think, is that God is not just our Father. God is our loving Father. God is love. Love originates with God. God is love. And, and any love that comes from us must come firstly, primarily, from the source of love, that is God. And so it's not about striving, it's not about religion, it's not about doing the right things, it's about imitating, it's being about being transformed by our Father. And when we, when we live in, in this love, it, gives, it, it, it transforms us. When we live in in the safety of a loving father, when we truly understand that God is the one who loves us, then that changes everything. It's important for us to understand that God is love, as John is saying, because that affects everything else. And for you parents, or for all of us, we should know this, that, that, that parents tend to set the tone for the family. And I find that really challenging. I don't know if you find that challenging. That was my daughter there, <laughs> learning some good things. Um, it, it, the father or the parents set the tone for the whole home, the whole house. And so when we say, when John says God is love, that sets the tone for the whole house. And so John then says that we can come to God firstly in confidence and secondly without fear. And I find this really interesting. So verses 17 and 18, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Confidence on the day of judgment. It's this sense of confidence as we look forward and we think about uh, all that is ahead. When we think to the day when, when the, the day of reckoning, when the balance sheets are, are sorted out, when we stand before God and we are judged and we stand there and we, are, we stand accountable for all the things that we've done throughout our life, all the good things, all the messy things, all the bad things, all the sinful things, all the broken things, everything. And we stand before the God who sees everything and knows our deepest thoughts, knows our deepest hearts, has seen everything. We don't come and we don't stand in fear, but we stand in confidence. We stand in confidence before God. And that is what John is saying, is we can stand in confidence. It's a confidence looking forward. It's a confidence in knowing how things are going to work out. Why do we have this confidence? How do we have this confidence? 
We have this confidence in verse 17. Why? Because we are like Jesus. We are declared righteous. It's not about what we have done or what we haven't done. It's all about what Jesus has done for us. And John says that that we stand in confidence because Jesus has rescued us. Jesus has redeemed us. Jesus has restored us. We stand in confidence because we are in Christ. We are in Christ. We are free. We are forgiven. And we can stand in confidence. It's a confidence in the future, but it's also a confidence in the present. If we look back to chapter 3, uh, we see that, that, that John says that we can approach God with confidence. It's the same word used. We can come before God. It's John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, if you want to look back at it later. But John is saying that we can approach God with confidence. And we can come before Him in prayer and say, God, I know that you love me. I know that you hear me. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I, I think in our culture, in our context, we don't really think about the future. I think in our, in our context, we are very much about what is present before me now. We don't think about what happens when we die, really. We don't think about the afterlife. It's just something we don't do. We are, we're more consumed with the present, culturally speaking. We're so, I just think that that's the case. Try and engage people to, to, to kind of think about the future, think about afterlife and all that kind of stuff is, is, is something that is, is difficult. But I think that when we know what's going to happen, when we know the end game, when we know that we are declared righteous, when we know that we're in Christ, we are saved, forgiven, free, restored, forgiven, when we know the end game, that, that must give us confidence in life. I don't know about you, when you, I'm one of those people who watches, I get quite tense when I watch movies that have tension. I don't know, obviously that's what movies are supposed to do, or certain movies, you get kind of wound up, you get, I don't know what it is, but you know, various movies, um, kind of the tension builds and you, you, you kind of get more nervous and you're on the edge of your seat. And what is, what's, what ruins it? is if you're sitting next to somebody who already knows the end. And they are, you know, this is fine, this part, it'll be fine. You know, you know it, I don't know if anybody else gets really annoyed when you're sitting next to somebody who already knows what's going to happen. They're just cocky, they're confident, they're relaxed. Meanwhile, you're kind of all just freaking out on the couch wondering what's going to happen. Maybe that's just me. That's fine. I've seen lots of blank faces. Maybe you don't get it enough. Maybe you should watch movies more often. I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit like that. We live in confidence knowing how it's all going to end. We have a confidence in life. And our confidence is not based, again, as I say, not on who we are. It's not, a base, based, on, sorry, it's not based on what we do, good or bad. It's based on what Jesus has done for us. It is in his name. When I, used, when I was younger, um, my dad was a, a kind of reasonably well known kind of in our area and kind of got to know various people just through his ministry and speaking and stuff like that and he through his networks he also knew some Christian rock stars or at least I kind of thought they were Christian rock stars no that they were um you know well known kind of musicians and I remember when I was a you know young teenager kind of starting to watch and get into music and stuff like that would go to these gigs and I remember going to one gig where where this Christian rock star was playing and I was with some friends and we went and saw them play and then, and then I said to, to my friends afterwards, you, you want to go and meet them? You want to go and say hello? Now, I'd never met the, the, the person before but I said, we'll be fine. You know, we'll be fine. We'll just go, we'll just go up. And so we wandered up to backstage and I said, yeah, my name's Andrew Serkham. <laughs> Could we see, you know, so-and-so? Uh, okay, well, let me just find out. Yeah. And, it, and we were able to get backstage. My friends were kind of like, wow, this is amazing. We get and I was like, yeah, that's it. It's all in the name, Circum. Now, I, I'll be honest with you, the name Circum is not always great. Most of the time when my name was uh, yelled out loud in the, in the school assembly, I would kind of be ducking because of all the nicknames that I would receive from that. But the name Circum did have its advantages in terms of having access into certain places. And in the same way, we come in the name of Christ with confidence. Jesus. Jesus. That is our confidence. And it means that we don't have fear. 
So John says we can have confidence, but we do not have and should not have, must not have fear. What kind of fear is John looking at here? Verse 18, just to remind you, there is no, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, perfect love, God is love. God is love in perfection. Perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with what? With punishment. The one who fears, fears is not made perfect in love. And here's the thing, this is the nature of fear because we can hear the word fear and get confused, I think, because there, doesn't the Bible say that we are to fear God? Well, yes, we are. When we come and we worship and we say, God, you are great, you are awesome, we worship you, you are king, you are Lord, we are, we're extolling, we are fearing God, we are saying, you are greater than me. That is a good thing. But what John is saying here is fear seen as, or fear of, punishment. The word punishment is also linked in this passage to judgment, just like confidence is. Confidence on the day of judgment, fear of punishment on the day of judgment. This word is only used one other time in the New Testament. It's used in Matthew. And Matthew uses this word punishment when at judgment. I think here that what we, when we see punishment, we see separation. What does punishment mean? Punishment equals separation. Punishment equals separation from God. You see, fear forces you to hide. Fear forces you to separate yourself. Fear forces you to run away. Let me give you an example. Genesis. Genesis, Adam and Eve, they reject God. They separate themselves from God and how is it manifested? It's manifested in hiding. It's manifested in fear. And so when we, when we look at this word punishment, our love is the op opposite of separation. Love is unity. Punishment is separation. And that is not the invitation that God gives us. Love does not lead to separation. Love does not lead to punishment. Love leads to God in perfection, all of him, knowing him, being with him. And so the invitation for us this morning is how do we see God? Do we fear punishment from God? Do we fear separation from him now or in the, in the future? Do we live in fear? Do we live in fear from what God might do to us? Or do we live in confidence knowing that punishment has already been meted out and that punishment was meted out to God himself? Jesus coming to take upon himself punishment and separation from God. See, when God came in human form, Jesus Christ, and he went to the cross and died, yes, he died a painful, excruciating death, but more painful, more profound was that he was separated God separated, and I don't, this is a mystery, but God himself ripped and torn apart. And in doing that, God takes the punishment for us so that we can come in confidence with him. Are you living in that confidence this morning? Do you truly believe the gospel? that Jesus has done it for you, that you can live in confidence with the name Jesus. Secondly, 
if most profoundly we are invited into a loving relationship with God, secondly, then we are invited into a loving relationship with our siblings, our brothers and sisters, the church. Chapter four, verses 19 and 20. Uh, to 21, we, ha- we love because he first loved us. us. If we say we love God, yet hate a brother or sister, we are liars. For if we do not, do not love a fellow believer whom we have seen, we cannot love God whom we have not seen. And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love one another. Firstly, John is saying in the, in the, in the most strongest of terms, don't hate. Don't hate. I thought it was really interesting that Louis, um, as we were coming into worship, shared from the Psalms and shared how unity is such a, a vital and important thing. The reality is, as you look around, as I look around now, we are all different. We're all different. We come from different uh, backgrounds, from different countries, uh, different economic kind of circumstances. And you know what, I'll be honest, when I come to church, a lot of the people that I hang out with you are not necessarily the people that I would initially just hang out with. That's just the reality. And I'm sure that I'm not the person that you'd really want to hang out with either. You're very kind. But the reality is, is that we are gathered together in unity, in diversity, in the name of Christ. Why do we love? We love because he first loved us. We are called to live in unity. It was really interesting. The Australian um, uh, elections were yesterday. And I was following along a little bit with that. And it was just, there was one line that uh, one, of the, one, and, uh, one of the politicians um, said on the losing party. He said this, disunity is death. That's it. Disunity is death. And the political party that lost had been just struggled for years with disunity. One of the things that I think that Megan and I have really been touched by and, and uh, moved by here is just the, the wonderful community, the, the vitality of difference. And we've just grown and loved in just the, you all. And I, I, one of the things that I've learned from Rick um, is this strong sense t- to push for unity, to serve the churches in this area, no matter what their opinions of us are, no matter what their churchmanship's like. Rick has always been a person who has sought to honor and to bless and to speak life and to speak uh, Uh, positively about other people and other churches no matter what they think of us. And that's something that I've learnt and my encouragement for us is to always speak with generosity and with grace about your brothers and sisters. Don't gossip. Don't speak down. Always speak life. Always speak hope. That is the sign of a loving community. John says, don't hate. But he does say, and this is gonna sound cheesy, don't hate, but pull your weight. There you go. Shocker. Don't hate, pull your weight. Because the reality is, is that love is costly. Firstly, love is sacrificial. It takes effort and commitment. It means sacrificing our time our talents and our treasures. And I wanna encourage you all is that if you want to be, want to know love more fully and more richly in this place, then give of yourself. Our model is Jesus who gave us everything. Give of your time, give of your talents, give of your treasure. And to keep in, in line with what we're looking at this year as a church, Give of yourself to others. Make disciple makers. We're in a year of discipleship. Are you being a brother or sister to those around you? Are you looking out for one another? I I say, even if you've just come in the last month, two months, three months, get involved, get involved in community. Give of yourself. The other thing is that, that with any home, every home has its chores. Every home 
has the things that, that need to happen. There are things that, that just need to happen so that this church functions. But there are things that need to happen so that we as people flourish as well. And, and John says this here, is that love worked out means that we will obey his commands. We will obey him. So let me say, encourage you as I encourage myself, obey his commands, obey him. Pursue holiness, pursue righteousness, pursue God. More and more, I, I, I'm convinced that the sign of spiritual maturity is two really simple things. And John says them so clearly here, faith and obedience, faith and obedience. The sign of Christian maturity is not time, it's not the amount of time, how long you've been a Christian, it's faith and obedience. I think for us, we have developed and grown in this place because we have lived amongst mature people. Megan and I have lived and been impacted by you, by people who are people who live in faith and who are obedient to the call of God no matter what it costs. And we have, we've journeyed with people. You have invested in us. And I look around and I see people and faces of, you have spent time with us, you have invested yourselves into us and we have, have grown. This is the place where we grow. This is the place where you will grow. Give of yourself. Invest in people's lives and you will grow. This is the place. And finally, if we are in relationship with our loving Father, we are in relationship in love with one another, finally we are in relationship with the world around us. I want to say uh, three really quick things before, as I close. Firstly, with a strong home comes three things that we can then engage with the outside world. As John says in uh, just the last two verses of our reading, verses four and five, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. How do we engage with the world around us? As John says, we overcome it. Well, firstly, we can overcome the world because we are in a secure home. A strong home, a loving home offers security. It offers freedom from fear. It offers freedom from pain. Well, not freedom from pain, but it enables us to be free to see through it, to see life and vitality. Secondly, it offers distinctiveness. We are distinctive in this world. You see, if we're not distinctive, then we have nothing to say to the world around us. We have nothing to offer. We ran a, um, an alpha course, our connect group ran an alpha course a few months ago, and um, we had a, an undercover journalist come uh, as part of it, and uh, it was really interesting to, to see her reflections in uh, national media after we'd finished the course. Very helpful. Um, but the thing that she, this journalist struggled with or just could not get above anything else was the fact that we were an open, vulnerable, joyful community. She just could not get it. She could not understand it. She could not understand that we could just laugh together, be together, enjoy one, of the, one another's company. And, and I think that, that that is what we are called to be. As a distinctive community, we will challenge the world, not necessarily by, shout, we, we, not by shouting at it with words, although words are important, explaining. But, but the way that we love one another, the way in which we see one another, the way in which we speak of one another, the way in which we honor one another, I'm recalling a prayer that Jesus prayed. The, the, that the disciples, that the church may be one so that when people look in, they see something that is unique, something that is distinct.
And finally, if, if, if we, engage, we can engage with the world because we're in a secure place, we are distinctive. And thirdly, we leave a legacy in this world. My grandmother, speaking of homes and families, passed away this week. She was a, a, an astonishingly godly woman. She was a, a missionary with her, her husband, my grand, grandfather, uh, still alive in New Guinea. They had seven children um, and they've got many, many children and, uh, so, sorry, uh, gr- grandchildren and great-grandchildren as well. My, talking to my father during the week or just after she died was just saying that they worshipped and they worshipped and worshipped as she was dying of cancer in her bed. Apparently it was profound. She has left a legacy for many, many years to come. She's invested in so many of us and she has seen, Dad was saying she just was praying for her grandsons, her grandsons, praying God blessing on grandsons. When we pursue God, we leave a legacy. And, and I can see that there is a legacy here. There's been a legacy left to us as a family. We have grown and we look forward to seeing how that, the legacy that started here will work its way out in Australia. There is a legacy being born here in East London. We're seeing it with church planting. And we look forward to seeing that legacy continue to grow. My, my encouragement, my invitation to you is to get on board, get involved, get in the home, see the legacy grow. Don't live just for yourself, live for a legacy. What will be your legacy? I'm definitely coming into land now. How do we enter God's family? Well, James says, believe. He uses the word believe two or three times, right at the beginning and at the end, throughout faith. Maybe you don't feel like you're living in God's love today. Maybe I've been talking about this whole thing about Jesus and it's like, and confidence, and you go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I want to say to you today is that you can step into God's family, you can step into love just by believing, by acknowledging and saying, yeah, I, I, I believe that Jesus, you offer this for me. Or maybe, maybe you have at some point said, yes, I do, I do believe. I do acknowledge that Jesus is my Lord, my King. He has died for me, but you have lost that confidence and your spirit has withered in fear. And you walk around wondering, am I loved? And I believe that today God is wanting to fill you afresh with a, a new confidence that is, comes from the heart of God, perfect love. I believe that God is wanting to pour on us all a fresh, a fresh sense of God's perfect, unconditional, amazing love. Can I pray? Lord, we thank you that it's in you that, that we are offered life, life and love. And we thank you, Lord God, that you invite us to be in your family. I thank you, Lord God, for this family, this church, that is such a blessing And I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to grow us, mature us, that we will be a people who live to see legacies in our lives, in this community, as we look to you. Thank you, God, for all that you are. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen.